Hey there, my name is Tiago and welcome to the Full Stack Essentials. In this course, we're going to build a newsletter service from scratch using production best practices and the latest tech. For that, we will be coding in TypeScript, we will use React for the front end, Node.js for the back end, MongoDB for the data layer, Prisma for the data abstraction, Express for the web framework, Tailwind CSS for our outstanding needs, and Grid to send our emails. And to top it all off, we're going to deploy everything to the Google Cloud Platform. Not to mention, we're also going to create a CI CD pipeline where everything will be automatically deployed after we merge any new code to GitHub. We will be designing the whole architecture from the beginning, as I will do in the real production environments. So that by the end of this course, you'll have a finished newsletter service for your own websites. So, if you're ready to learn some new skills, let's get started. Alright, so this is the home screen, nothing fancy, just some marketing text and the text field. And the text field we write our email. When we hit sign up, we get the confirmation the email has been sent and we are asked to confirm it. So let's just confirm it and then I'm gonna show you guys what's done behind the scenes. So what just happened was that as the user, we sent a sign up request to the API. And then the API notified the PubSub on the cloud environment to a specific topic. And that specific topic was being subscribed by this guy here, the send confirm email. And he did, after receiving this topic, he sent to the send confirm email with its payload. So we're going to send stuff like the email and the confirmation token. And then on this endpoint, he spoke to the mailer service. And that was the first flow. So the second flow is after we get to the confirm email, we click that button and what happened was that we sent a request to the API where we confirmed it with a token. Of course, the API is going to check the token validity and all of that, but we are going to notify the pub sub. And then again, on the cloud environment, there is a topic that we sent to and a subscriber which is listening to that topic. And this subscriber is the welcome email. And this is a new part of the flow I'm going to show you guys what happens now is that we sent a welcome email. So this is the first email that we sent to the user telling him, hey, welcome to the newsletter. So this email, we should have already received it. Here it is. Thank you so much for signing to our newsletter. We are happy to have you on board with us. Now, this is the whole flow. Two more things that I want to show you guys. The first is the Prisma Studio. So this is the UI that comes up with Prisma. So the version of Prisma that we're using comes up with this npm command that spawns this UI so we don't have to install any third-party software, which is nice. And don't forget that all of this is backed up by MongoDB. So we have this table per se, which is this document, which comes up with this ID column, an email, token, confirmed, active, and timestamps here. So the ID is going to be a generated ID for this user, the email, the token here is deleted because after the user is confirmed with deleted token to avoid conflicts and the active flag to meaning if the user is active or not and the timestamps just for reporting purposes or anything else. So now we have the complete picture of the service. Sounds a bit complex, but it's really simple. I'll guide you through step by step and any questions you guys might have, feel free to leave them in the comments below and I'll clarify you. All right, let's get coding. But the first thing we need to do is to get a template to bootstrap our project. For that, I have created a small scaffold project that we can quickly start and avoid wasting time on installing dependencies and dealing with all sorts of problems. We have monorepo on the full stack essentials that we can start using it. For that, let's just use this template and click the create new repository. And let's create a repo on our uh, profile. Let's create it. So after it's been created, let's push this code to our machine. Get clone and the URL. Okay, so we have the project in our machine. Let's cd into it and open 
on the other dwarf hedgehogs. For me, it's going to be VS Code. So here we are. On the package JSON on the root folder, we have it's just a local script that runs both the server and the web, and that's how it does. The server, we have a source and a test folder. On the source, we have the routes and some server configuration as well. The routes is going to be the meat of the code. That's where you're going to create the newsletters um, routes. Then we have the service, the, the, the server, sorry. This is where we create the express server and mount any of the routes. We also are going to inject here our dependencies. And then the index is just calling the, the server. So let's do an npm install just to fix these errors. So let's cd into the server first and npm install. Now that's done, let's check out if the error is actually fixed. Looks like so. We don't have the squiggly lines from the dependencies error. And so we can try to run the project and see if it works. So let's run the local script. Okay, so we have an error. And this is fine. Because we're currently not handling not founds, which is okay for the service we're building. We don't expect users to hit our API unnecessarily because we only have one client and we control it. So let's check the front end now. Just like the server, we need to install the dependencies on the web application. So let's npm install as well. Now just to check here, I'm not sure if you guys are running the correct node version, but I have a file here that specifies the node version. So I'm running the 18 version. This project requires 18 or upper. So this NVMRC, I have 18 version here, and this server as well, just to be consistent. So this is the most current version I have right now. And if you guys run any troubles when installing, the first thing you should check is the node version. So the packages were installed successfully. Let's check it out. And we have no errors. So it's ready for us to work on. Turn the code, let's open the web source and let's create a routes folder. These are going to be the direct linking between the page, a React page, and the actual URL on the browser. And let's create the signup page, newsletter signup. This is going to be just a dummy component for now. We are going to change that in the future, but for now, for testing purposes, it's fine. Sign up page, just so we know that it's the signup page. And one thing I like to do is to create an index file and export everything of the routes here so it's easier and more organized to import them after. Okay. Currently, what we have is this sign up page and it directly links to the home page, to the slash. But if we wanted to add a new page, we couldn't do it properly because there is something that we need to link this new page to a new URL. And for that, we're going to introduce a router. So these are the three pages that we're creating, the send, the confirm, and the sign up. All of them are going to be um, sent from a router, and all of them have their unique URL that represents them. That's what we're going to do. And the go-to solution for that in React is the React router. So let's check the documentation to see how they actually do it. So here on the feature overview in the client side routing, which is the routing we're doing, we can see that they import the router and here we define all of the routes and the components directly. So the, here it's in line component, but you're going to directly paste a page. And here we have an about, and we need to inject a router provider on the root of our project. So this create root is actually the, the most parent component in drag. So if you, well, so let's actually see in our code here, where, where is it? It's on the main, and here we have the create root. So the whole React application is inside here, so it's app. And if we want to render the signup page, we need to do it here, so signup page. And there is no way to render multiple routes here. So what we need to do is inject this provider and link it to our router. And that's what we're gonna do now. 
but first we need to install the package and for that let's check the documentation and we are not going to use this because we already are creating the projects from a template so we're not going to create the project from scratch instead i'm going to paste this part here on with this we don't need the other packages so just the npm install react router dom and let's go to the console and install it okay so it's installed and what you need to do is let's go back to the documentation again and copy and paste this router provided here import the the router from here the provider sorry and now what we need to do is create the router let's create the router which is going to be a create browser router where we are going to pass an array actually of the okay we can do this so it's the slash and the action let's see if the actually is the action now it's the element and we paste here the element when we don't need this and remove it and this is it let me just format this corrector okay and with that we're actually complete we have the router in place let's actually test to see if this works let's go to the console and render project and pm run local and open on the browser cool we can see that we have the sign up page that we created and we are on this slash so it's working Let's just do another test to see if we handle 404s. And we somewhat handle it. This is a developer warning, meaning that we need to do something about it. We need to either create an error boundary or an error element. And that's what we're going to do now. And again, on the documentation, we can see that stick creates a reusable component that is going to be used as the error boundary. So here we check, we get the error. We see if it's an error from the router and we render some uh, some text with the error. So let's actually do something like that on our code. Okay, so if we have here an error element, we can have, for instance, a 404. Let's just do this and test it. And we should be on a 404 page. And we are. So we are on this route that doesn't exist and we have a 404. Awesome. But we can do better and let's create a error page error dash page so let's just create a component we can modify this in the future as we want and let's return an error page or error page for offer let's include this on the index as we've been doing awesome and finally we are going to replace this by a component. Oh. Error page. That is coming from the index. Awesome. So here on the code, on the page, we have the error page 404. So that is complete. We are handling 404s. And let's move on. I've just noticed that I have here uh, inconsistency. So it's called newsletter signup, but the component is actually called signup page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this newsletter prefix and add the page prefix. It's consistent now. And another thing I've noticed is that I'm importing from the route directory and not the index. Signup page, sorry for that. And now let's continue with the error um, page. According to the commutation, we need to import the hook and handle the error that we get from the hook on a statement here. Now, we're going to skip this because we're going to make something simpler and come to this implementation later. Now, what we're doing is that we get the error again, we console log it, and then we do this part here different. If the error is not the error response, we just say that something went wrong. Now, this is going to be temporary, and for our case, it's fine because we are handling the errors on a different place. The errors that come from the API, I mean. So, in case of the error happens, we render an error message with the status and a message. And that's how we need to do for now. And we can see that the changes reflected 
on the browser from the code. Although it's not centered, that's what we're gonna handle with the styling now. For our styling needs, we're going to utilize the WinCSS because from my experience, it is the go-to solution for speed and consistency in the CSS ecosystem. It might be weird to use it at first, but you really get up to speed with it. You can see that we use classes that are converted into CSS after the build. So for example, in case you might not be familiar with CSS, this is it with uh, Tailwind. Let's then get started and copy these two commands. I'm just going to start with this one for now, which installs the Tailwind as a developer um, dependency. And now we need to initialize it where it's going to create a file with configurations. And boom, okay, it's great. We can see that we have Tailwind config here and we have the package. Tailwind. Okay, so let's actually try to style it now. On the error page, let's call the class name. And the first thing that you might notice is that you might, if you never used Tailwind before, is that when we try to use a class, for example, let's go to this example here. We have a background with the color. And what might happen is that you don't have IntelliSense. So when you hover, we don't have the explanation of what this is doing. And as you type it, you don't have the other colors as well. So for that, you need to go to the VS Code extensions. So click it and search for the official Tailwind CSS IntelliSense. Make sure it's the official. And after we install it, reload VS Code and you should have IntelliSense on the, the code itself. After that, you should see on your code suggestions. And if we type something, for instance, text center, we want to text center all of this. We can see that when we hover that it translates to text align center. And on the browser, we see that nothing is happening. This is because we are currently not finished with the installation. One thing that we need to do is copy these directives into our root CSS. So let's go here. Before the root, let's import everything here and save. From the documentation, the last step is to build the process using the CLI command. And we're going to do something different here. Instead of running this command every time we want to convert Tailwind into CSS files, we're going to do something different. We're going to integrate build tools from Vite to do this in behind the scenes. So here from the documentation, we have the install Tailwind CSS with Vite. We're going to follow this instead. So we're going to do an npm install again with this post CSS and the auto prefixer. These are the tools that are going to do the, the work for us. And let's initiate again the Tailwind now with the P flag. And this created two config files, one that we already had and another with the post CSS. Let's now configure them. So let's copy this contents and paste it here. So what's happening here is that we are telling Tailwind to watch the files, the index.html and every file that is in the source ending with these extensions. So behind the scenes, Tailwind is going to convert those classes, those Tailwind classes into actual CSS files. And that is all for us. We can now run the project locally. And we should get the styles. So here are on the sign up page. Let's go to the error page where we actually did styles. And boom, there you go. Error text and the text is centered. From this error page here. The text center and the red text. It might not seem much, but we actually did a lot of work on the front end here, setting up everything. So let's take this time to commit. So I usually prefix the changes with the type of work I did. So for instance, this was a chore. It was a setup, the web service and commit. Okay, so the next step is let's create the sign up page. Now that you can do styling, 
let's actually create the page. Right, let's remove this text and let's add the root style. So here we have some margin, margin bottom, we text center everything. The text is going to be 3XL, basically 30 pixels, and it's going to be bold. This is going to be the heading that you guys saw. Have a title. Welcome to the, the next line. Newsletter set. I'll make the newsletter service orange and add below a subheading. Please sign up below to get to be the first to get 25. Let's check our changes. There you go. Now for the button, I'm going to wrap everything again in the div. So we can have more space here. Another one, this is going to be the button space. It's going to be a flex column, text center again, and justify center. Again, another div, it's going to be a flex. I'm going to add some margin and center the items. Just another div and the level text. So we will also add some feedback. So this is going to be the error message, which is going to be the feedback, it's going to be red. And last but not least, the input. So we're going to have the email, a placeholder, and the unchanged that we're going to configure in a bit. We also have some styles to make it rounder. And outside of this div, it's going to be the button where we click to sign. So hopefully I didn't go too fast. Uh, I didn't want to be writing the code and explaining all the styles by hand because it's not the focus of this course. But if you want to type exactly as I did, you can stop the video or go to the GitHub repo on the description and copy the code from there. In order to send the data to the server, we'll need some states for the email and the error message here, as well a function to set the email as we type. And finally, we need a function that is going to be called when you click the sign in button. And to tidy all up, let's fix the imports. Import from React and also update from React. Awesome. So the component is working. Let's check it out. Awesome. So the design is getting closer to what we envisioned in the start, but the sign up button still doesn't work. And for that, we need to go to the backend and implement our first endpoint. Enough for then for now. Let's get our hands dirty with some backend. We saw from the signup page that we need to create an endpoint to sign in the user, right? So let's create it. Inside the source and the routes, let's create a new folder called newsletter. We're going to hold all of the newsletter endpoints here and let's create a sign. I always mistype it, sign up, but yes. Inside the file, let's create the handler, sign up handler. We're going to have a function that returns the another function. This request and response comes from the express router. You can import it directly from, the import doesn't work, but from express directly. Let's wrap everything in the drag catch and let's extract the email from the payload. Now we need to type this body. We can create the type here in, in, on this file. And what we're expecting is actually an email. And it can be optional. And that's all. Then we need to validate the email. And basically we're checking if the email is not present, we just throw an error. For now, it's fine to just throw JavaScript error because in the future, in a couple of minutes, we're coming back and create a standardized error for all the error codes that we're going to have. This way, we can reuse the template for all the errors and the user of the API, the consumers, always get the consistent error message. Still in the process of validating the email, 
we need to actually open the email and see if it's a valid structure. For that, we're going to create a small utility function where we're going to do that. For that, let's go to the source and create a folder called utils and create a file called email. In this file, we're going to have functions, small functions that can be reusable for everything related to emails. Oh, is email valid? And the way we're going to do this is with regular expressions. I'm going to leave in the description below the link to this file and you guys can copy it because typing the regular expression itself is a bit cumbersome. This is it. This is where I took this regular expression. It's from the regular expressions site, regex101. It's really interesting to actually type the expression yourself and see the um, the test strings and all of that and explanation it explains way better than I would. So if you guys are interested in that, I would advise you to go to this link. Now, back in the code, we can just import this function. Don't mind about this error. It's fine. And import from the utils. The next step would be to upset the subscriber in the database. So if we check our diagram, we can see that we need to store the database user and then notify the pub sub. Now, we don't have any of that infrastructure yet. We don't have the database and we don't have the pub sub created yet. So for now, let's just return the test message and then we're come, going to come back here and implement the actual details. Just like React Router, in Express, we need to define the mapping between the URL and the handler code. For that, let's create an index file on the newsletter folder and create this function. We can import this from, here, uh, from Express. And what it does is this is going to initialize the router and set up the route for us. So here we do from express.router and we create a post request with this signature. So it's going to be a RESTful endpoint end with the newsletter plus sign up and the sign up handle can also import it. And it's done. Now we just need to link this router to the main express middleware flow. That is done on the server inside the create server. Here we have the bootstrap of the express server. Now, when the request is done to an express server, what happens behind the scenes is that express goes through all of these middlewares whenever you see this use inside is a middleware. And what happens is that the request might go to some transformations like this one, where the requester swims into JSON, it's just some URL encoding, and then it reaches, for example, a route here. So this, everything with the slash v1 is going to inside this router, which is the health router that come with the project. And now it, what we need to do is do server.use. We can still use the slash v1, but here we're going to create a newsletter router, which is this router that we just created. So it's linked. It's the final piece of the linkage. And if the request doesn't match any of this, it's going to throw an error with a not found. And in the worst case scenario, we don't catch it and we go to the error handler and we throw 500 with uh, an internal server error or we debug it for debugging purposes. Now, before we move into the front end to implement the sign up call, let's just fix this linting error. What we need to do is just return an error, throw an error, and it's good now. Let's go back to the front end and call this endpoint. Just an aside, I went to Postman, which is a tool where we can test our endpoints. And I wrote the, the little endpoint that we just wrote. I put the email and I sent and we have the response. So we can be sure that it's actually working before we go to the front end. In order to call the API, we need to make a fetch request when we click the sign up button. So just below here, let's do a try catch where we can actually just console log the error and maybe throw anywhere. We're going to revisit this approach in the future, but for now, we just want to see the project run. There can be unknown. And here we do the fetch. Let me just make this async. And okay, so we're going to make a fetch request using the fetch API to API rail, which you're going to define 
newsletter slash sign up and you might remember this is the URL that we created is going to be a post and the body the body is going to be a stringified version of the email so we're going to do tracing.stringify and we're going to put the email in there and that is pretty much it let's just create this API URL for that let's create a utils folder just like the backend and create a constant let's then define our API URL which is going to be oddly enough just slash API now we are going to use a little trick that we can use with the Vite server so if we go to their documentation under Vite option under server options here we can define multiple options to configure the Vite server for example we have the host we can change the host we can change the ports that we're serving but most importantly we are interested in the proxy now we're going to implement and configure this proxy and this is going to allow us to do requests to slash api and behind the scenes vite is going to redirect the request to an actual endpoint this is neat for multiple reasons the first is that people often serve their react application from the same host as and port as their backend implementation let's take this example here the front end and the back end are served from the same host it's the full stack essentials on the other hand we have this case where the um, the back end is hosted on google on the cloud run function and the front end is hosted on netlify which which is actually 100 percent free by the way it's nice to serve just applications here now this setup that we are implementing is not required if we have this setup here this is the desired setup now it's conveniently because we can do stuff like this we can do requests with the slash api and we don't need to input the url every time we do so if we were doing requests to the full stack essentials api we would have to write it every time we want with this we just do slash api and we can just leave it up to the invite server to do the requests to the right place another interesting thing that we can conveniently fix is course issues Okay, so now that we saw how that works, let's actually configure the Vite server on the vite.config.ts. Here, let's actually delete everything and start from scratch. So, export defaults. What I usually like to do is export like this as a function, and inside we actually do the return and define the configuration here. Let's add back the React plugin so it works. Now, let's configure the server the proxy and this is going to be the prefix the target is going to be we're going to make something different so instead of hard coding our url let's put inside a template string and call it from the environment variables now one thing that we need to take care of is that we need to prefix with the vite underscore app prefix so that it works on the vite server this is something mandatory that they require us to do otherwise they will not be able to read it if it were just uh, api URL. okay so change origin is true as well and the rewrite this is a, uh, this code i'm taking from the documentation guys in case you're wondering and this is done okay so in order for the envs to work we need to define and load them so let's do a process dot Env. I'm going to do it this right process.env, which is going to be like this. But first, we need to load them. Uh, load env. And here we're going to pass the mode and the process.current working directory. And we can do an empty like this. Okay, so this is right. Let's just double check. If you have not already, create a .m file on the root of the web folder and paste it in the vite underscore app dot api URL with the correct URL. And that is it. Let's go back to the sign-up page and continue. Next, let's parse the response payload. So it's the JSON object that we want. And this is going to be, for now, just a message, okay? 
that we can't do much with it but let's parse it either way because in the future we're going to return an actual object with data and we just have the infrastructure here ready we need to define this interface here just so we don't have to type any and string now we need to see if the request is actually an okay response where we check if the response not status is either 200 or it's a 201 and if it's not okay we need to show an error for the user and this is where we're going to use this set error message so if the payload is a string we set the error message i see that i have a typo here so let me just quickly fix it message so if it's a payload string we just say the payload if not we are going to return actual error for the user with the invalid email please verify let's try again and last but not least we need to navigate the user to the next route which is going to be the confirm email sent so at this point the api is going to set the user in the database and send a pub sub request that pub sub request as we can see here is going to alert the subscriber and he's going to send an email so by the time that the user gets to this page he's going to have an email in his inbox that he needs to confirm for that let's navigate using the navigate we actually need to use the history router also let's just fix this linting error here we can remove this actually and just also log it and set the email to empty so that the user can retype it again okay so we're ready to test let's go back to the console and go back to the root what is going to be the root project if you haven't made already make sure that you have the node modules installed i'm going to install them again and here we have the run local which concurrently runs the server and the web we need that local and we can see that as well the the front end is running on the port 301 instead because we changed it on the configuration here so now it's running on the port 301 uh, 3001 instead of a random one now let's go back to the bug now let's see if everything works i'm just going to clean the the requests and sign up okay so awesome the request worked we got the okay and we were redirected to the confirm email sent page confirm email sent so that's the first poll complete so with the front end already configured let's go back to the server and start adding our database and the orm prisma let's go to routes newsletter and sign up okay so here we need to do the database request to start the user and then the pub sub notification let's start with the database i think it's very important for us to set up uh, right from the beginning right we're going to use prisma let's go back to the documentation so this is going to be the setup for mongodb the database we're going to use and typescript so the prerequisites we already have except we don't have access to mongodb but we're going to have it in a bit i'm going to show you guys how to create a free database using mongodb so the project setup we don't need to do this we can skip it we already did but we need to install the prisma and types let's just actually install everything from here it's not it's not gonna um, gonna be fine if we do that the server and let's npm install prisma type script test node and let's save let's develop okay so now that's installed let's go back to the documentation and continue so we don't need to do this we already started the typescript configuration and we can revoke the prisma cli we can let's try it out it works so it installs and now let's do the init 
All right, so your Prisma schema was created. Let's go back to it. There we go, Prisma, Prisma.schema. So this is where we're going to define the database structure and the configuration and the provider. For default, it comes with Postgres. We're going to change it in a bit. Let's just continue following the, the documentation. So here we go. I'm going to replace this. This. Just change this, but you never know. And then in this case, what happens is that this is coming from the environment variables. So we need to set it up. When we run this script, Prisma created the dot m for us and added the database URL. We can do with this one. This is for Postgres. We are going to create now a database URL in the MongoDB cloud. So let's open a new tab in the browser and type MongoDB. It's going to be this one MongoDB. And let's create a new account if we don't have one already. And fill these steps. So I'm just going to skip. You can also log in with Google, but I'm going to skip these steps because I already have a, an account created. So I'll see you in a bit. All right. So once you have signed in successfully, let's go ahead into the projects tab and create a new project. I'm going to call this newsletter. Newslettering. Yeah, sounds good. We can create the members and permissions for now. I'm going to be the project owner, so let's just go ahead and create project. And OK, so now inside this project, let's go ahead and create the database. All right, so now you're greeted with this interface where we're going to select the free one. Now select the region where you're at. I'm going to select the closest to me, which is going to be Frankfurt. I'm going to select the name for the cluster. It can be a newsletter as well. And create. So after that is done, we are redirected to this page where we are going to create first our user for the connection. So here type some username and type your password. You can also click the auto generate secure passwords and then copy the password that you wish to some file. Then and lastly, we need to choose where we connect them from. Now, this is optional, but it's ideal for us to click on the add my current IP address so that only us can access the database and no one else. So only you on your IP address can access the cluster. Once that is complete, you have successfully created your first database here on the Mongo Clouds. Let's go to the newsletter and I'm going to let you export this on your own, but if any of this doesn't make sense. The only thing that we're going to use is the collections tab. This is where all of our data is going to be stored. But for now, we need to first connect to the database. So in our code, let's copy this connection string. We can actually just copy this, it's easier, and replace the env here. So this is going to be the username that they created. So for me, it was, let me copy from my paste here. It's this one and the password, it's going to be this one. Now I'm showing you the all of these because by the time you're watching this course, all of this database is gone. So don't share this password and username on your GitHub repo if you publish this repository. And now the database name, we can choose anything that we want. I'm going to call it newsletter. And that is it. Okay, so let's try to connect to our database through the code. But first, it makes sense for us to create some data. Let's create our schema. It's going to be called newsletter subscriber. Subscriber, not subscriber. And it's going to have an ID, which is going to be a string, ID identifier, and the default value is going to be an auto so it's going to be auto incrementing and let's map this to the id field now this is something that we need to do only for the mongodb so mongodb ids are strings and are uids so we need to add this signature here for it to actually work it's a mapping it's often a hack but 
just do it once and it's going to be a string the email and unique now the token is also going to be a string the confirmed now this is the structure that we saw when i demoed the the database so we're just replicating the same structure active also going to be boolean and finally the timestamps created that and the updated that awesome so that that is it before we can use prisma in our code so you would call prisma somewhere here first we need to do two things one is that we need to initialize this schema apply the schema using the prisma client that's what we're going to do first and then we need to create the prisma client so let's first go to the documentation again creating prisma and here actually here this is the the note that i just said about the id so there are also a number of subtle differences when using relational databases like Postgres. For example, the underlying ID field name is always an underscore ID and must be mapped with map ID. So MongoDB requires us to have the underscore ID to work. So all the MongoDB schemas have this ID as underscore. So that is why the reason we are going to call this ID, but behind the scenes is actually a map to underscore ID. And that is pretty neat because we can avoid writing this in our code. Okay, so let's go to install Prisma clients. And here we need to install this. So let me go to the console again to do this. After that is done, let's go back here. And we need to do the Prisma DB push. So this is whenever we do changes on our schema. So whenever we change this file, we need to run this command so that it creates indexes and regenerates the Prisma client. So Prisma is very type safe. And the reason for this to work is that whenever we do changes here, we have an object somewhere where we can do the Prisma client dot our uh, newsletter subscriber. And this is going to work seamlessly with TypeScript because all the changes are created on the node modules. So, and for that, we need to run this command here. So let's go and do npx prisma db push and we got an error now the reason that i got this error is because the configuration for my m file is wrong and let's fix this if you get this error the best approach to fixing it is to actually go back to our database on mongo atlas and see how they recommend us to connect because the way that i'm going to fix is might be different from the way you're going to fix on on based on the time you're watching this video so let's go to connect drivers and here we have node.js selected and fiverr or later so if you have a more recent version it's going to have you selected probably and let's copy the string now we're going to replace our string that we wrote with this one but we need to type the password there so i'm just going to type it below here get the usernames already there so let's get the passwords and replace and don't forget to remove these brackets as well. Now we also need to write the database here. So I'm going to copy, paste it. I'm going to replace this with the old one. And let's try now. Okay, so it worked. But it wasn't that the first time that it worked. I got another error, which is this one. Now, if you also get this error, I'm going to tell you how to fix it go to the database network and delete whatever IP you have here. So for instance, now I'm allowing every IP, so I'm gonna replicate the steps I did. Delete it and go to the database. So before, check that this is configuring. So this is applying the changes, but then go to the database, right? Go to connect. And now you brought, you're prompted with this. What you do is you allow access from anywhere and add the, this IP address and choose. All right, so that's done. Now, the reason that we had to do this is for some reason, my IP address was being blocked by their servers. So I just allowed everyone to connect, which is okay for this project, but in a real production environment, you should not. And after I ran this command, it works now. So if you run that problem, please do this step. If not, just continue.
Okay, so the last step is that we need to get a Prisma client and connect to it and actually do inserts, requests, whatever. And there is two ways to do that. So the first is to create a global Prisma client. So somewhere here we can create a client. Usually people do is create the, the client.ts and they export here the Prisma client as a global uh, singleton. I usually don't like to do this because it's going to be a bit cumbersome to test. We can mock that, but either way, I don't like to use singletons that much. When I can, I, cr I like to use dependency injection and that's what we're going to do. So let's go here to the create server and add the, the, the dependency that is going to be Prisma and it's going to be the Prisma clients. It's not showing, but let's now use the Prisma. Oh, it's not showing because this is, should not be a type. Sorry be here prisma this is the type definition and it's going to be a prisma client and now what we need to do is basically pass this prisma into the function now below so for instance the newsletter is going to require the prisma and what i'm going to do i don't like to see this i'm going to create an interface for that let's create create server params and define it server so this is going to be our multiple um, dependencies that we're going to inject. For now, it's just Prisma. Prisma clients. There we go. Winner. And let's do the same for the, the router here. I'm going to receive Prisma. And we can actually let's do this instead so it's a function that instead of receiving an object let's just call that it's going to prisma client it's fine either way okay so prisma and finally let's send the prisma here to the signup handler where it's going to prisma prisma client so this is the only drawback from this approach is that we have to manually pass the dependencies but it's not that deep that it's going to be cumbersome so we just did this once now everywhere in the in the newsletter we have access to the prisma clients it's not going, okay so on any endpoint we just have access to the prisma and it's easy to test the signup handler because we just can mock this okay so prisma client here and now we can actually do stuff with it So basically, we need to create the user newsletter subscriber document. And for that, instead of writing the logic here, I'm going to create a service folder where we're going to hold business logic. This is the HTTP layer. The only thing we do here is either return an HTTP status or do some computation here. But we never rely on uh, the actual implementation code. So every implementation is going to be inside the services. And we're going to create a newsletter service. So this is going to be newsletter.ts. Actually, I'm going to move this folder out and delete the folder. You don't, you don't need this. Okay, so pretty function, export const, absurd, forever. We need to pass the Prisma client as well. Right, let me just import it. And the other one is the email. Okay, let's wrap everything in a dry catch. And we can just throw a new error for now. Then again, we're coming back to this later. I'm just gonna leave it like this. And here, now we're going to start talking with Prisma. This is going to be the newsletter subscriber. And we can actually do this, yeah, so Prisma.newsletter. So we can see that now we have the um, auto completion for the newsletter subscriber. And this is going to be exactly what we um, created. It's going to be hard to find here in, in typings, but you can see here that if we go to the fields, we have the active to confirm that everything. So let's just do an absurd. So the absurd is going to be a create or an update. 
the reason that we're going for an app start here is that if the user signs up so this is going to be the the landing page right so the user types the email and signs up there's a chance that he might try to sign up multiple times and instead of throwing an error we're going to let the user pass and that's the only reason why just for a better user experience so let's create so what happens here is that if we want to create so if the creation if the user doesn't exist we are going to create an email with the active false as as starting it starts to have false confirmed false it's not confirmed and the token is going to be let's create a new function here called create random token and let's define this function somewhere gonna find it here for now actually let's do something let's go to the utils and type uh, random dot yes and here let's create the create random token and it's going to be something like this yeah but instead of 32 i'm gonna put a uh, 64 to be more secure i can return in line we don't need this return and now let's import crypto crypto is a package that comes up with nodes this to fix this typo crypto. okay so we can now import this in our file awesome and now for the updates in case it's an update we need to basically update the basically i'm going to just keep the active and the confirm as false so we don't override it and let's put in a token there okay now where the email so we want to filter by the user by the email in case he exists so this where just makes sense if the user uh exists so what happens is that prisma will first find a user with this email if it doesn't exist it will create if it exists it's going to update now we just need to return this all right so we have our first service and let's consider And for that, we need to pass, we need to import this. Not what, okay. Prisma and email. Newsletter subscriber. Such a lazy type of that. Type anything. Adjust this copilot. And here, <laughs> let's return the, the subscribe itself. The okay. Awesome. So one thing I'm gonna do here, uh, we don't have a logging. We need to create a logger. But first, for now, let's just keep a log. And I'm gonna set that to sign up. To say success, not successful. Yeah, it's like we do like this. Okay, so there is gonna be a next step, which is to publish. Notification to pop up. Now, we're not going to do this right now, just in a bit. But first, let's try to call this endpoint from the front end and see if the newsletter subscriber is actually being created in our database. So let's go to the console, go back, and run both projects concurrently. And Okay, so we have errors. Okay, so let's go back to the index. There's something I forgot to do. Now on the index, it's creating the server and we need to pass this dependency. We completely forgot about passing Prisma. So we, don't, we didn't even initialize it. Sorry guys. But the Prisma, new Prisma clients. Any part of it. What is going to be the actual Prisma client initialized? Awesome. With that, it should be fixed. We have a typo somewhere. Um, okay, so it's the health. We have a test that we need to fix here. Awesome. Prisma. Oh, this is the beauty of dependency injection. Is that injection? That is, I'm gonna create um, Prisma client here as well. 
and pass it here. We could create any class that would implement Prisma client without functionality, and this would work as long as it's a Prisma client. Now, for this, it's fine, but in the future, we're going to come here and really use the power of dependency injection. Now we have another error somewhere on the index. Uh, where is it? Do we? Let me try to rerun the project. Okay, it's fine. Awesome. Let's open this link. And let's just watch here on our database. Let's go to the newsletter collections. We can see that we have this database document created. So this was when we did the npx database push. This created the, um, the, schema, on, the schema on the database and also created the types on our server somewhere here at the, the Prisma types that allows us to do this um, direct typing to the, the schema. Now, there is a thing that I noticed that is missing. So when we do this request on the front end, we, where is it? Here. So when you do these requests, what's going to happen is that it's going to fail. Reason is, I completely forgot to pre-append, pre-suffix this v1 here. And with that, I think we need to restart the server. It actually started, so let's try. And put an email. So we got the sign up handle success log. Worked is redirected and let's see finally the database click refresh and we should have a document here so our first user was successfully created we got a huge token we might not need it to be that long though but better safe than sorry and here is the email to confirm the active and that's that's them now that we've got the endpoint working Let's write some tests and make sure that we don't break it in the future. Now, before writing the tests, it would be nice if we could replace these errors with actually responses to the user with a clear message and the uh, status code. Because when it's success, we are actually turning 200. But when it, there's an error, for example, this validation error, we are throwing the application. What's going to happen is that in the server, this is going to be called and we're going to throw 500 every time. So the user is not going to receive the message nor the specific feedback. Now, when we're writing a RESTful API, it's nice that we can actually return the appropriate status codes. For example, here on the Mozilla documentation, we can see that there is a bunch of status codes. We can see that the range between the 200 and the 300 are success. Then we have redirections, client errors, and server responses. We are throwing 500, 500s, which is not good because in reality, what's happening is that it's a validation error, it's not the server. So it would be nice if we could return a client error. For example, a bad request, it would perfectly fit this example. Unauthorized, if the user wasn't unauthorized. So you get the gist of it. And when writing the tests, it's nice to check for those cases. So let's then create routes here. Um, actually, in the source, let's create something called the errors. Everything related to errors is going to be here. And let's create an um, API error. It's going to be our error class. So the error is going to be an export class from the error code, from the error, JavaScript error. We're going to call it error code. And it's going to have a code that is going to be a code interface. Codes. And let's define that. So that is going to be an export type codes, which is going to be a type of. Actually, it's going to be the keys of, of a type of errors type. So. Now the errors is going to be an object, which is going to be a map between an error code, for example, 001, and an error message. For example, email 
is required. Okay. And this is going to hold that mapping. Now, whatever error message we can have here, we're going to tap it here. For example, email is invalid. And the good thing about this is that it's just one place to store all of the errors on the application and we, and we know the codes. But let's take, for example, that we have an endpoint that validates not only the email, but he also validates the, the token. It's going to be a new, error, a new error code. And he also validates the, I don't know, the username. Now, this is very repetitive and it doesn't add much value. We can do better if we create what I like to call a substitution string. And this is going to be way more valuable. Now, this error is, can be extended for any thing that is required. For example, we can pass the key to be an email, a username, a token, a password, whatever, you name it. And the reason that we're going to do this is that we have the leverage to do so because we have a custom class, an error class, so we can actually create code that replaces this with something. And for that, what we're going to do is go back to the constructor and create one. This is going to be the key, so I'm going to call it key, and it's optional. Not all, er not all errors are going to have a key. Right? So the first thing we need to do is create the message. And for this, what I'd like to do is let's create a new function that is going to handle that. So, for example, get error description where we pass the code and the key. Let's create this function here. Get error description. This is the signature. And inside, First thing we need to do is to actually get the error description for the code we want. So error description, uh, error description, error, and the code. Oops, errors and the codes. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is create the description. So this is going to be the message sent to the user. And I'm gonna do something different here, which is instead of just returning this description here, I'm going to prefix it with the error code, so like this. So the reason we're prefixing the error with the code, there's a couple of reasons. So the first one that I'm going is when we're writing tests, instead of checking the description, because the description is a long text and can be changed, the error code never changes. So we can check if the string contains the codes. Another commonly used use case for this error prefixing is, for example, let's, let's imagine a front-end application where we need to translate the error messages for the user. The front-end code can easily extract these codes and replace it with a translated string. Now, if there is no key, we return the description. And finally, we return the description dot replace with the substitution key and the key. Now that is done. Let's go back to the constructor and call the super. And finally, let's assign the code to these codes. Awesome. So we have our custom API message and let's consume it on the endpoint. We have these error codes and replace it, for example, on this one. So this is email is required and they created something is required. So let's replace everything, import it and say that we're going to use the error 001 and pass email. What's going to happen is that email is required. Okay, and this one is email is not valid, so let's create a new error message. And now you can see the gist of how easily it is to reuse and compose messages. It's not valid. Is not valid. Email is not valid. Okay. Now there's one final step because at the now we're currently still returning errors, so we are still throwing. At the end of the day, this is still an error, just a prettier error, but we need to handle this error on the catch. And this is where we're going to return. A response for the user with the status code. 
So first let's start typing everything here. So this is going to be an unknown error. We don't know what type of error. It could be an error code, it could be an error, it could be, I don't know, a Prisma error. And then we need to make sure that if this is not an, an instance of the error code, we are going to log first. So we don't have a logger, that's going to be in a bit. But let's do console log for now, it's fine. I'm going to copy this lineup handler and say that this um, is just an error. And pass the error here, so just for logging purposes. And then we can throw new error. Going to be the worst case scenario. And we pass the error as a string here. Now, at this point, we know that the error is an error code. So if the error dot codes is equal to, for example, the error one, we want to return a response dot status for hundreds. Now if we check again the documentation, we know that the 400 is a bad request, meaning that the client received the malformed request. So at this point, the client sends an, e an email that is not valid. So we want to say that. And we can just pass the error dot message, which is going to be the message that we create with the, um, with the API error. Awesome. Now, the 002 error, this one, it's also 400. So let's include this. So let's refactor this in a bit. So let's do error 2. Or I'm going to actually make this 400. And say that if this array includes inside the error code, then it's going to be 400. Now we're including all of them. And finally, if it doesn't match any of these, we are going to return the status code of 500. So basically, we're getting into the server again and saying this, but manually here. We could also throw an error at this case, but fine if we just throw 500. It might depend on different endpoints. It might be a per case endpoint that we might want to return a different error message here. But for now, this is fine. So just to quickly show you guys what's going to happen for the user. So let's make an invalid email with two ads and let's send. Awesome. So now you're having a 400 request and the error code. And you can see that we're returning the codes and the message. So now we're ready to start writing some tests. For that, let's first make a distinction between the two types of tests that we're going to be writing. The first for this project are going to be the integrations and the other one are going to be the unit tests. Just these two. And the first one, the integration tests are going to be the most important in my opinion because this is going to test the HTTP flow. Going to make sure that the API signature is the same for the consumers. We should never break the signature of any moment because that means that the front end is going to stop working. And if this front end breaks, the clients cannot use the application. And this is also the higher level view test. So it's going from the high most top to the lowest point. So it's going to integrate services, going to integrate HTTP and everything, business logic included. Now the unit tests are going to be just the service tests. So we're going to test the services, but this doesn't add much value because as you can see, this is a repository call. So we're calling the database and creating something. So a test, if we imagine what we could test here is just testing if the entity was created in the schema. And that, to be honest, doesn't add much value because I'm assuming that Prism is already working. So, okay, let's create then our first test for the signup endpoint. And what you can do is copy everything from the health because it's quite easy and replace whatever you need. So it's going to be the sign up and it's going to be the slash newsletter slash sign up. Just to make sure we don't get into any errors, let's go to source, routes, and copy paste the actual signature here. In this case, I think it's good. So awesome. It's going to be a post request. And we're gonna send, and for this, we need to first send some data, right? So we need ideally to send the email, but I want to check 
that this is going to file as we want with the empty uh, inputs now there's a very neat package that i forgot to tell you guys which is coming which comes with this project which is http status so instead of having to memorize and going back to the documentation for the codes what we can do is use http status from http status and have access to every uh, name for example the bad requests you can just return like this and it's going to return a number with the appropriate code so let's just come back here to the sign up now this is optional if you guys want to keep the, the codes i'm going to replace with the actual http status let me just import it is imports and replace it here I just think it's more readable at the end of the day. So it's going to be HTTP status OK. And then here is going to be the bad request. Bad request. And finally, the 500 is the internal server error. OK. Awesome. So let's go back to the test. And here, what we want to test is should throw an error. It row 400, if not, send an email in the body. Okay. And remove this expect okay, because we're not expecting okay. And add the bad request here. Bad request. Okay. Now, before we can actually run this test, because it's actually working, but there is a problem. Problem is, we are passing a real Prisma client inside of the server, so database calls are going to happen. And the problem with that is that our schema is going to be modified. So data is going to be added, deleted, and whatnot. Now, this is our production database. We don't want to mess with it, with the tests, obviously. And there is two solutions for that. The first is mock the Prisma client. So we can create a mock of this client and at the end of the day what would happen is that whenever we call anything prisma related an empty function would be called so nothing would be upset that is fine but it doesn't add much value for us it would be more valuable if we could instead create a testing database which is pretty easy on mongo and run the tests against that database so let's go with that solution i'm going to show you guys step by step the value that you can get with that so let's for instance call it this integration tests and the collection name can be the same name whatever so now we have two databases which is the news letter and the integration tests now one thing that we need to make sure is go to the to the project root in the server and create a file called .env .tests. This is very important otherwise it's going to fail and we can go ahead and copy the dot m for the production and replace this with the dot dot uh, dot m this dot m test is going to be the environment variables for testing and here let's change this this is very important and change with integration tests with the same string here that we did so integration tests and replace this so now the tests are going to be run against this database when we run this let's try again but actually before we test it this is going to fail per se because this case here is obviously going to fail which means that the database call is not going to happen so let's just quickly write a new test here making sure that this flow it it works so should return 200 if the email is sent the if and valid email is sent right so let's copy this fine valid at email it doesn't matter whatever the email it's not going to be sent anything um i'm going to make sure that this is not a, like this and expect okay we can also expect that the the payload is going to be a JSON payload, so we can go ahead and do this. I expect the content type is a JSON. Now this is optional. I like to make sure that we actually turn JSON, 
but it's whatever. Okay, so let's go ahead and run these tests. Now, before we actually run this, let's make sure that we don't create any memory leaks. So let's go to after all. So after all the tests are run, these are hooks that we can call code after each test or after all the tests. And the first thing I'm going to do is do a server dot close. So I'm going to close the server. And then I'm going to make sure that I await Prisma dot disconnect. So we're disconnecting from the, the connection from the database. And okay, let's skip this for now. And before each, let's make something. So before each test, because each test, ideally, when writing good practices in tests, each test should not. Um, I imported here. So before each test, it should not interfere with the other. So if this test requires this test to run and to be successful, then this is not a good test case. So we need to make sure that it's a clean environment before you run each test. And for that, I'm going to have a cleanup stage where we're going to make a Prisma call for the newsletter, subscriber, and delete everyone. Delete many. Now you can see why it's important to have a, a testing database and not use the production, right? Um, but with this, we are actually tests ready. Let's just make sure that the dot .env test is with the integration tests. Awesome. Now let's run the code. Go ahead and do an npm run test integration. And boom. Okay, so both that's passed. We have the console log here. Awesome. Awesome. This is the health check as well, which run. Now let's check the database. So at this point, we see that this passed, of course, it failed, but it didn't create anything. But this test here, it should have created something in the database. Let's check it out. Let's refresh. And there we go. So here, here, here we have the newsletter subscriber and we have data. Now this data is, of course, different from the production database. But we can see that we are actually creating data. So this is an integration test with some value. And what we just did, it's not good because as I have told you, when we run this test again, it might fail because data is already created in the in the schema. So we need to delete all of that data that we create on the test after the test is done. So we need to clean up after the test. So for instance, say that we need to clean up the whole database after it's finished. So we know in the future that what we're trying to do, await Prisma and delete many here as well. So now if we run the test, the, the schema should be empty. And there we go. So now that you understand how the tests work, it's pretty easy to expand upon this framework. So I'm just gonna, gonna quickly create some tests to make sure that we're covering all the cases. So for example, we should return a 400 if the email is invalid. And this in case it's not a valid email, as you can see. And finally, another huge test that I'm gonna paste here is that it should not fail if the email is already signed up. It should absurd. So as you guys saw in the endpoints, we are absurding. So it's an absurd subscriber. There is no check here if that the email exists, we fail, we don't do that, we actually absurd it. And we need to make sure that we test that behavior. So what you're doing here is that we have an email, we do our first request that successfully creates the, the subscriber, then we find a subscriber in the database, and we do another request. And we need to make sure that this second is actually has a, an updated token, and it exists, right? And finally, this is it. So this is all the tests. I'm just going to do a quick change, guys. I'm going to make 201. 201 is a created and not an OK, just so we are more semantically correct. And let's just run the test. Now, this is going to fail because I did this change. And I want to show you guys that the tests work by failing it. So we can see that this test 
it returned it to 101. We wanted to, to return it to 101, but it actually returned it to 100. So let's correct this. Let's go back to the signup and change this to a create. Now, if you run a test, it will work. Awesome. So what you just learned is a very powerful tool. So tests is very powerful as a developer to have in your tool sets. And I see a lot of code bases in, in production in real world that don't even leverage tests. And this adds, adds a really good layer of protection and confidence when writing new features. Now, the next thing that we're going to focus now is the Google Cloud Platform. We're going to create and sign up a project. So from scratch, I'm going to show you guys how to create a project and set up a PubSub environment. So let's go to the browser and type in cloud.google.com and we redirect it to the Google Cloud Platform. Now, I must preface that this step of the course might include financial costs for your site. So infrastructure actually costs, although it's very, very cheap what you're going to use. For example, I didn't pay anything when I built this course, so it might be different for you. You might have to pay some cents, but to avoid that, you can subscribe to these 300 free credits that Google provides for learning purposes, which is more than enough for your needs. And the first thing you need to have is actually a Google account, which I pretty much assumed that you have. So sign up with your account and then I'll see you guys on the other page. So after you have created your account or sign up, click on go to console and you redirect it to this page. So this is the actual GCP platform uh, overview. So in this page, if you're a brand new user, you click here on the select project or create projects and new projects. Now here, this is going to be the name of your project. It can be anything. I'm going to count newsletter course and hit create. After that is created, let's select project and we're in. So this is a dashboard of every infrastructure there is in Google Cloud now. This interface might change a lot. It changes during the, the years. Google is always making updates to this. So it might be a bit different by the time you're watching this, but this is it for now. And just to recap you on what we are actually going to be building on the cloud is that we're going to set up a WebSub environment. So Google has this WebSub API that you can use. So if you tap WebSub, this is the one. So it's enabling the API. So Google has multiple APIs for different things and you need to enable them per case. Now it's done. And here we have the topics, the subscriptions. So subscriptions are going to be what we subscribe to topics. So topics are the different ideas that we can create for example we are going to create the send confirmation email topic for example and here we have that subscriber so this subscriber is going to listen to this topic any messages sent to this topic are going to be read by this subscriber and then he's going to do something and this something is going to be a post request to our api to the send confirm email endpoint that we are going to create now, let me be honest with you. A question that you might have asked already is why do we need all of this? Why don't we just call from the signup endpoint the mailer service? And that is a very valid question and the one you should be asking as well. Because why do we need this actually? And I'm going to tell you the, the reason why I chose to have this cloud environment. Now, the reason is that the mailer service is an external dependency to different websites. For example, we're going to use SendGrid, and if SendGrid for any time of the day is slow, the response for the user for the signup is going to be slow. For example, if this takes 10 seconds to respond, the signup will take 10 seconds plus whatever it takes already. And that is also not going to be scalable because if you have multiple servers running these codes that all call the mailer service, it's going to be very slow. So, not only by introducing this asynchronous process, I'm going to be able to teach you guys Google Cloud, but it's way more scalable for your newsletter service on your website. 
another clear advantage is that let's say that we want to respond to different events so whenever a user signs up you want to have a different subscriber for example here we're sending an email but you might want to send a cms message you might want to show him um i don't know communicate with him in a different way you could create a different subscriber just for that case and this subscriber will goes into this topic let's take this example on the welcome so the user is already in our newsletter now we're going to use that topic to send them an email you might want to use this subscriber or another subscriber to do another action depending on that action and that is a very good way and scalable to do this all right let's create our first topic then let's name it newsletter sign up development we're going to have two topics and subscriptions for each type because we're going to have the development and the production one so we can differentiate the both two and we can disable this we're going to create the subscription right now and hit create okay the topic has been created let's go back to subscriptions and create subscription now this is going to be the subscription responsible for sending the email the first confirmation so let's call this send confirmation email and again development and it's going to be the subscription of this topic and the delivery type is going to be a push because we're going to make an http request when this subscription is evoked and now for the url now this is the tricky part and i'm going to show you guys the solution that we're going to now there's a couple solutions but i'm going for a tunneling solution let me show you what i mean now this is our problem we are running our application on local hosts and we want to connect to the PubSub, which is on the Google Cloud Platform. Now, Google doesn't accept local host endpoint URL because Google cannot communicate to our local machine. It's not possible. So the way to fix this is, the, or the way I'm going for it's a tunneling solution. For example, in this case, we have local hosts running on a machine and we're going to port forward it to a different service. For example, there is Interview.net, which is what I'm going to use. There is ngrock, which is a very known one, but it's paid. If we want to get the, the features that we want to use, it's paid. So I went for survey.net. And what's going to happen is that Interview is going to redirect our application to the internet. So it's going to be widely accessible to everyone. And this is what we're going to do. So let's go here to the browser and type Interview.net. This is their page. And let's copy this command. All right, so before we hit enter, we, it's important that we change these variables to our needs. So the first thing is that we want to create a custom name. So before the 80, let's call this, for instance, you can call this whatever you want. I'm going to call this newsletter service course. It doesn't really matter. Then it's going to be, instead of the 3000, it's going to be the 8080. This is the port of the server that you're running. If you're running the server on a different port, use your port and then survey.net. Let's hit enter now. Now it's port forwarding, whatever we are. So whatever the local host 8080 is doing, is serving, it's going to serve and port forward this to serve you. So let's boot up our server. And now, if we go to these endpoints, it's HTTPS, we should have our application. So our application is deployed on HTTPS, newsletter service course, serve you. Awesome. And with this, we're going to copy this URL. We're going to back to the Google platform, paste this. And the endpoint that we want to hit is the... the newsletter sends confirmation email right so let's copy this and paste this so we need to prefix this with v1 and that's it okay you might have noticed that we don't have this endpoint currently and that is fine for now we're going to create that in a bit and this is the endpoint responsible for actually sending the email but for now let's focus on configuring this subscriber okay, this is fine this is fine and let's just change retry after exponential backoff. 
And I think this configuration is fine like this. This is all that we don't create an infinite loop if there's an error on this subscriber. All right, let's create. So we can confirm that it's created. So now what we need to do is integrate Google on our code base and actually communicate with the PubSub. So firstly, let's create a service, which is going to be the PubSub service services actually and that's why it's a folder you'll see that in a bit what i mean by that first let's create the types yes so this is going to be the general interface it's going to be an export interface pub sub service and it has two methods which is a publish and the validate payloads so the publish it's what we're going to publish the notification to which receives the topic and the payload and the validate payload receives these payloads. Okay. Now let's create a file, a new file called gcp.s. This is going to be our GCP pub sub. And let's also create a test dash pub sub. .ts. So here let's create our test pub sub, which is going to implement pub sub service from the type we just created. And the first method, validate payload, receive the payload, and just returns if it exists or not. And the publish, we just do console log and return the promise not resolve. So this is just a testing pub sub, just so we can actually implement it in the code before actually calling the Google Cloud. And this is the magic of creating this dependency injection layer. So let's grab this, go to the signup. And here we need to do get the reference to this pub sub. So for, for example, going to happen is going to be pub sub dot publish. And for example, um dot publish. And I'm gonna come back to this in a bit. So this is what we're gonna do. First we need a pub sub and it's a second dependency. Pub sub, which is the service that actually this is not correct. It is the interface service. Let's import it. And let's add the references on the on the rest sub. Here as well. And finally on the V1, we need to create send the pub sub. That is coming from as well the pub sub. Let's change the these params to pub sub, which is going to receive the um, the service. And with this, we just need to send our implementation. So here, throwing an error, and we need to send a pub sub, which is going to be a new tests pub sub and with this we are receiving a pub sub on the signup which we need to send a topic and the payloads and the payload let's just say data hello world okay and then before we forget, let's go to the tests and actually pass the dependency. Now this is where this new test dependency is gonna come into play. Test pub sub. In this way, we don't need to mock anything and we can actually create behavior with this test pub sub because we control it. And on a sign up as well. And I'll just import it and that is. That is it. Let's boot up the application and test it. Let's sign up. And what's happening here is that we got the console log. So in theory, we sent our our data because the implementation for that pub sub is just a console log. So go to the tests. We are just console logging and resolving the promise. So that works. Okay, let's then implement Google Clouds into our, our API and consume the actual pub sub. Let's do an npm install with the add Google Clouds 
सब सब so with the package installed let's go back to our code base and open the gcp file so here we're going to create the class for the gcp handler so get the google pubsub service which implements our interface on the types and we are importing the the service then we're creating a client which is going to be a reference to the google cloud pubsub clients we are going to initialize this in the constructor in the constructor we are going to receive the project ID and set the client to this new pubsub. Then, let's implement the rest of our interface. We need to implement it here, where we actually need a topic, a publish and a validate payload function. For this, let's start with the validate payload, which is simple. And here, what we do is is return is pubsub payload, and this is going to be a function, a special function, which is a TypeScript type word. This receives a payload and asserts to another type. Basically, by returning true or false, we can assert this type. So, at this time, we are just validating if the payload obeys this structure. And this structure is this interface here, the GCP PubSub payload. This is what the Google platform on the, pub, the PubSub service has and returns. So, we are expecting a subscription, a message, and inside is going to be the data that we we want to extract so this is the validation process now for the pub uh, the publish so starting here what we need is a topic name so we need to build it so this is going to be it the projects the project id slash topic and the topic id and the environment is going to be development or production now i've made this from if you go here to the topics you can see this string i'm gonna go in and you see the string here the projects the id of the projects of the google cloud project topics and the name of the topic itself so this is how we build that string next we check if this exists i'm going to make this asynchronous here we're checking on a function that we're going to create if this topic actually exists and this is going to call the uh, the client and check if this topic is the platform because we don't want to be publishing messages to topics that don't exist so here let's create this function check if topic exists and receives the topic and then what it does is this it calls the client and the get topics function inside so you can see you have a lot of functions that google provides we're going to use topics and we basically will find if there's one and return as a boolean then and finally we need to create a topic object using the client and then returning the publish message so this is going to publish it to the platform and the data is going to be a prepare publish payload so because this data needs to be a specific format it needs to be a ui ins array or a buffer we need to prepare it first because we have a json object okay and for that let's go up here to the function below the constructor and let's create a static prepare publish payload and receiving that payload and returning a buffer for that let's construct it we need to stringify first this payload and then pass that string into the buffer where we create it and finally to fix this error we need to create this node dev and let's go to the utils create a new file called constants this is going to be constants from the .m file, like we did on the frontend project. And let's create a node env where we can either access the project, the process.env, or have a default for development. So we don't need to actually define this on, on the .env. But for production, we're going to inject this variable with the value production. Okay, let's import this. And it's done. Let's now go to the index file. And pass a new GCP. What's the name of this guy actually? Uh, Google. And import it. For this, we need to pass, as you saw, um, a project ID. The way that we're going to get it is also from the process.m. Going to be this new variable, GCP project ID. Let's save this. Go to the .env. 
and add our GCP project ID with the project ID. Now for you, the ID is going to be different. You can get it from here or the drop down here. I'm going to save this and I think we're ready to test. Okay, this is the topic name. And then it's going to be prefixed inside the publish with the environment. So it's going to be development. So don't, no need to prefix it here. And let's go to the API and start it. Now, what's going to happen is that the subscriber is going to hit this endpoint, but this endpoint doesn't exist and it's going to fail. Now, instead of that, we can see it's failing. It's going to work. If we start up Servio, we can see that the, the tunnel is going to be hit, but it's going to keep failing, failing. But that doesn't add any value. Instead, let's just create a quick endpoint on our API, which is going to be the send email. So let's go to uh, the routes and let's create a new route. It's going to be the send confirm email dot ds. Let's, we can copy paste from the signup the structure. I have it here. The send confirm email handler. And let's create something here. First, let's wrap everything in the track catch, like we did. And the first thing that we want to do is get the payload from the request. So this is how we get it. Then we need to validate it. For that, we already created a function, which is called the sub sub payload. Let's import it and return an error code. Now this is going to be a new error that we're going to create. For this time we are going to actually use a new ID. Or yeah, let's create the error now. And go here. Let's create this error 003, which is invalid pub sub payloads. Fine. Copy. Write it there. Then we need to parse the payloads. For that, let's get from the body, the message, and the data. And I'm going to call this encoded JSON object. Then we're going to parse this buffer. Remember, this was a buffer. And we're going to get that from base64 and to string. Then we get the JSON.parse and that buffer. Now, if you don't understand this piece of code, it's fine. I got this from the Google documentation. And you can get it from there as well. But then the next step is the send email. And here we can just console log and send this for now. But finally, and most importantly, we need to return a response with a success status. For example, this, and I'm going to use the HTTP status codes, which is HTTP status dot okay. And I like to keep this uppercase like this because it's going to be an enum and the error we can just um do this for now and come back here later and with this done let's go back to the console and create our tunnel which is the servio okay so it's up let's go back to the application and hit sign up now let's see this happening okay the super facts actually so the sign up handler the first one on the confirmation it was the sign up success and then inside the handler this is the console log that we just write here. So, meaning that we parse the payloads, but most importantly, Google hit our API from here. So, HTTP request from this IP to our server. Awesome. So, we have a pub sub layer done. And what we have completed is this. So, we have the sign up, we have this asynchronous environment on the clouds with the topic and the, and the subscriber. And that subscriber is reaching out to these endpoints. Now the missing part is the mailer service. Let's go back to it then. So before we tackle the mailer service, let's first tidy up the error handler on these endpoints. So just like the sign up endpoints, let's do uh, not check if the instance of the error code is an uh, of the error is an error code. If not, then we know for sure that it's an error code, and we can match this error that we drew for uh, bad requests and finally if none of that works let's just redraw an error and we're done so let's get back to the fun part now after that is done we can go ahead and replace this console log with 
the actual implementation of our new service, the malware. But for that, let's go back first to our malware service that we're going to use. We're going to use SendGrid. And let's first create an account if you don't have already. If you have, click on sign in. And here, just create an account. And after that, I'll see you guys on the dashboard. So now that I'm logged in, I'm in the platform. And for now, we're going to leave it. Let's go back to the code and install the SendGrid package. So here on the terminal, I'm going to go back to the server and do an npm install with the at SendGrid slash mail. After that is done, let's go back to the code and create a folder on the services. Now this is going to be the services for the malware. Just like the pub sub, we can have multiple ones. So this is going to be malware. And the first one I'm going to start with this time is going to be the same grid implementation. Grids. .ts. And I'm going to also create how should we call them? I just call it test mailer. Gonna be the mailer for the tests. Let's start with let's actually start with the types as we did. For these, let's create a mailer service interface and then these two methods. So one for sending the confirmation email and the other one for sending the welcome email after the user has been registered. And for these we're gonna have multiple payloads. So the first one is going to be like this so we can have a optional email and a token and then the second one is just going to be an email and we can leave it like this save and let's implement our test mail so it's going to be the test mailer that implements the mailer service then we're going to have the first method the send welcome email just console logging the second one the same and then let's just import the types and that is it for the test mail. Now for the send grid service, let's do the same. Let's create a class that implements the service. Then let's create a read only property, which is going to be the sender. Now this is going to be our own email, the business email that we're going to send our customers with. Then in the constructor, we are going to call the send grid SDK and set our API key. We're going to go back to this in a bit. But for now, let's continue implementing the methods. The first is going to be the send confirmation email. We're going to receive the mail and the token. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get the application URL. This is going to be the front end application URL. Then we're going to redirect to this route that we're going to create with the token and the email. Then we have this template ID, which is going to be an environment variable that is going to contain the templates that we're going to create on the SendGrid platform and its unique ID. Then let's have some logging just for debugging purposes. And finally, let's call the SendGrid.send with the subject. This is going to be the email subject, the template ID, the from, which is going to be the sender, and the to. So the receiver of the email is going to be the, the user email. And finally, the dynamic template data is going to be a substitution link variable that we're going to replace on the templates. This is going to be so that the user can click the link and register it. And this link is what we have here. So after the user clicks the link, it's going to be redirected to the app slash confirmation email page and the token and the email. Then on the application, we are going to send a request back to the API to validate this token and the email and actually confirm the user. Let's just import these types before I move on. So this is coming from, actually I'm gonna do under all my same types. And then I'm gonna import here at the top, the send grid one, which is import send grid from the package that we just installed. Now what's missing is this config for that. Let's define an interface up here. Send grid config, and then we're gonna have the API key and the sender email. Now for the app URL, let's go back to the constants file and define our app URL. We, we can leave the defaults like this. This is the port of the application on the front end, and then just import it. Actually, let me just confirm 
that is the port defined now we don't have a port defined let me just define a port you guys can also do this port 3001 so this is going to be the port for the front end otherwise it's going to be 5000 and something and on the constants it is the one okay that is correct and finally let's import and implement the last function very similar to what we did i'm just going to paste the implementation so we can move on i need to put this as a sync and what's happening here is that we get the template id from the send confirm email different from this one take notes then we just do some logging and we send it like we did now in this time we don't have any substitution variables i'm just going to destructure the email from the parameters itself and there we go we have a send grid service complete now what we need to do is just like we did with the pub sub let's add this dependency into our server here send grids new send grids service and pass the environment variables that we need for this api key and then we have the sender which can be like this then we pass the send grid into our create server let me just update the definition it's going to be a mailer service i think that's it yep the mailer types then we are already receiving here so we can just say send grid actually i'm going to call this mailer it wouldn't make sense to add the send grid definition to the mailer it would defeat our purpose so mailer we pass mailer into our router and oh, mess this up and here we're also going to pass mailer and mailer service okay and finally we can pass mailer to our sense confirm email we don't need to pass to the sign up because the sign up doesn't send mails then here and finally on the dependencies part let's just say mailer and add the mailer service again now we can actually send the email guys go here replace this actually let's keep the log for debugging purposes make a wait and do um which one it is it's the send actually this is wrong though i implemented the wrong mailer service this is a send grid not ours let me try to import this again from make sure that when we import you import the mailer service not the mail service and from the right place uh group the imports be correct let me see if I didn't mess the other index as well. So here I'm importing. Yeah, it's wrong. So make sure that when you guys do this, you don't make the same mistake I did. Okay, so I think it should be correct. And let's finish this up then. Sends the confirmation email and the parsed payload.email. It is the first. Let me actually open this. We need the email and the token. This is the email. And then the token. Let's do this. Better yet, what we can do is just pass this as a parse payload. And that's going to be easier. And finally, so before we can test, let's first add the environment variables. This one is optional, but you can add up your all. Then the send green is going to be the send green API key, the sender email. And basically, this is going to be the email that you created your send grid account. This is going to be the template ID that you're going to create in a bit, and this also. So to get the API key, I'm going to show you guys. So heading back to the send grid page, let's go back to settings, API keys. Let's create our API key. Here we can type something. I'm going to just dev key two because I already have one, and click on full access and create view. Then this is going to show you your API key that you can use. Now, make sure that you store that API key securely on your Envars because you're not going to be able to show that page again. So just make sure that you already have it. And then paste here your email. And then let's go back to the template ideas. So we are finally ready to create our first template. For that, let's go back to the email API. Click on dynamic templates 
and hit create. So this is going to be the confirmation email. Hit create. And now let's add version. So we can either start from a blank template or we can get a template from the workshop. There are plenty of them. If you guys are creating a business, you can start from one of these. They are pretty good. But because this is for learning purposes and I want to move quick, I'm going to go with the blank one. Okay, so here let's create a version name. I think this is irrelevant, but still let's call it the confirmation email. And the subject is going to also be the confirmation email. I think you can pass this from the code and it's going to be overwritten from the template, I think. But I'm going to have that there either way. And here let's have some text. I'm going to just write something I have. We're almost there. We just need to confirm that you want to receive our emails. Please click the button below. So awesome. Let's then create a button and drag and drop it here. I'm going to change the title of the button to confirm. And the URL is going to be the substitution variable that we have here. So I think all we need to do is this. If that is incorrect, we're going to go back here, but I think that's it. And then that's going to be replaced with the actual URL, but let's hit save. And let's go back. Now let's get the ID of the template here and paste it in our environment variables. So for this, this is going to be the confirmation email template and replace it here. Now we can leave this for now. Let's first test our actually first email sending. I have started the server, but I have an error. And the reason is that we completely forgot to go to the tests as the last dependency here. Let me just do this really quick. So this is what I did. I put the mailer with the test mailer, and then I passed the mailer here. Now for the sign up, I need to do the same. I'm going to copy paste from there, put the mailer here, and finish with the imports. All right, let's see if that fixes it. All right, you guys can see that also the front end is running on the port 2001. Now let's open it up. Now, almost just forgot that we need to start up Servio so the Google Cloud PubSub works and they can connect to our machine. Put it up. And now let's hit the endpoint. Sign up. The confirmation email has been sent. Go back to the logs. And we have some logging. This sounds like an error. Error provided at least one. Okay. Let's see what's happening. All right. So I just found out the error, why it's failing. And what's happening is that under the newsletter on the sign up endpoints, we are still sending the data with the hello world. So Dummy mistake from me, what you need to do is replace this with the actual email and the token that we just created. And then another additional thing that we need to do in case you have done the same exact things that I did. So what happened now is that we are getting multiple requests from Google until it's going to fail. So let's just cancel this. What we need to do, go back to the Google Cloud, go into the subscriptions and flush out any messages here. So. Let's click on, I think it's relay messages. No, it's not the relay messages. It's the purge messages and purge. So what's going to happen is that the messages are still being received. So they are still being sent with an outbound um, timing, but we want to purge them. So that's non messages that we care about. So that's just something we just need to flush out of the system. Now we are ready. Let's boot up again, Servio and our API and test this one last time. Okay, let's go back to our application, put the email and sign up. Now I have the confirmation sent. We can see that the email has been sent with the token and everything. And then we have that the Google Cloud sends requests. Now the reason that there is multiple requests here because I clicked the button multiple times. And that's fine. 
One of the reasons why we created an absurd is for that not to fail. So, if you go to your email provider, you can see that you received the email, the exact one. Now I'm gonna just hit the confirm button, nothing's gonna happen. We can see that we got an error, and that's because it doesn't exist this route yet, and we're gonna implement this now. But let's take a moment to celebrate that everything we did so far, it's very impressive what we did. So we created a signup, did all this pub sub environment, and we finished this whole first flow, even the mail service. So all of the external dependencies are in place, and we can call this a newsletter application, but first we just need to make sure that we can confirm the user, because if the user starts typing emails that don't exist or he doesn't have access, we, are, we should not accept them as our customers. For that, we need to implement the confirmation mail flow. So after the user hits the button, we saw that we're redirecting him to this URL, which is this one, with a token and email. Then we need to send this back to the API, and the API is going to, if that's valid, so we're going to validate the token. And if that is valid, we're going to update the double that he's confirmed, he's in. And then we're going to notify the pub sub service that uh, for this topic to send a welcome email. So we are not decoupling, we're, we're actually decoupling the confirmation from the welcome email. So we don't have to wait time if the either one of the services is slow. And finally, we send again the, the email from the mailer service. And this is going to be the whole flow of the system that we're going to build for the newsletter. So currently our confirm email send page looks like this. And so before we can implement the success confirmation page, we actually need to give some love to this one and implement some UI for it. And currently what you're doing is just having an inline component here. And let's start by fixing this. Confirm email send page. And now let's go ahead to the routes and create the page component. Confirm email sent page. Yes. X. Okay. I'll then create the component. Confirm email sent page. We're going to use the hooks, the use location, and the navigate. We are going to access the email from the state, the location. Then we create a function to handle go back. And finally, we return the UI. So what's happening here is that we are going to have a button to go back. And then we are using this email to show the user's email. So confirmation email has been sent. And then we pass the user email where we're coming, where we're getting this from the location state, so the URL. Then let's just hook up the route to the component and we should be done here. So as you can see, the UI has been updated and we have it here. You can go ahead and actually test this from the start, sign up, and then here we have the, the email. If you're wondering where this state comes from, you can see that I'm sending when on the sign up page, when we navigate, when the request has been successfully done, we navigate to the route, and then we set the location state as an email. And you can do this on the router, so you can persist state from one route to another one using this state property. All right, let's go quickly over this final page. I'll just have this set up here. We are going to need some states to start if the user has been confirmed or not. Then we start those two hooks again. We get the params from the search. And finally, this is the most important part. It's just a user effect where we get the email and the token for the user. And then if they exist, we can continue and make our final request to actually confirm the user's email and the token. The token is like a NASA access key to validate if this request is valid. Now we can have a handle go back just like the other page. And finally, we return some UI. All right, let's try it out. First, we let's just copy the component name and let's hook it up the page to the route. So for the last entry, path confirm email element is going to be the page 
and finally an error element you can copy from this one and paste this all right now we should be ready to do another test it's not going to work because this endpoint does not exist so before we do that let's actually go to the api and create a quick endpoint for this so under the api on the newsletter index file let's create our last endpoint which is going to be the confirm email so we're starting to see the finish line finally and let's create a file confirm email dot ts just like this then let's create a quick handler confirm email handler we're going to pass the prisma and the pub set dependencies and then let's wrap everything inside the quick try catch then we first get the email from the request and the token then we validate the email so if it's not an email we just send a bad request and an error code i'm just going to import every dependency okay let's create this interface right now this is going to be basically just an email and a token that can be optional in case they are not passed and then let's import http status as well i like to have it uppercase so i'm gonna leave it this and then we need to also import the request and response from press. We then check if the email is valid. If it's not valid, we return a bad request with the is not valid key. So email is not valid. Let's just import here. We then validate the token. Then we find and confirm the subscriber. This is going to be a service method where we find and then Mark has confirmed the subscriber. We also delete the token. Then we notify the pub sub. Then finally we respond with an OK for the user. Let's implement this uh, service method. Let's go under services, newsletter, and define the function. Use the Prisma, the email, and the token. Then we find the subscriber by the email and token. If he doesn't exist, we throw an error with the 01 token. And then we update the subscriber by the email where we set the confirm as true and we delete the token. And finally, we return the subscriber. Let's go back to the handler and import it. Now it looks pretty good. The only thing missing is, of course, the pub sub setup here. We need to replace this to do with the topic name. And let's go back to the Google Cloud and define it. Let's start by creating the topic. Go here to create topic and we're going to name this newsletter email confirmed and fix it with develop and we can uncheck this and create it now that has been created let's head back to topics here so newsletter email confirmed development and then we have the sign up development go back to subscriptions and create our subscription so this one is called and confirm email development Let's create this one as newsletter welcome email development. The topic is going to be the email confirmed. It's going to also be a push, and the URL is going to be and welcome email. So it's going to be here HTTP newsletter. Then we have the send welcome email. This is going to be our last endpoint that you're going to create right now. But first, let's just finish this setup. So this is fine, fine. Let's just change the retire policy and create. After it has been created, let's grab the topic name, newsletter, email confirmed development, and let's paste it in a project like this. We can remove the development because we already know that it's fixed on the pub sub service itself. And now the last thing we need to do is import from here and also define a new and the last url and that is the send welcome email where we don't need to send just the hours and none of those and it's going to be called send welcome email handler like this let's create the file for it and welcome email handler email just like this just send welcome email we don't prefix the the handler 
and then here okay so this is the power plate for the handler we can move very fast now because we already have most of the infrastructure that we need and the code for it so let's get the body parse the body in case if it's a pub sub payload not with drone error then we do the whole parsing so this is what we already did on the sign up we get the parse buffer we decode it and then we have here the json objects payload from it then we go to the mailer and send the welcome email with the payload and finally we respond with an ok status code and again the error code the, the error handling is just like the same you can go ahead and implement it as well and there is two things that we are missing the first one is importing this and the second one is here we are implementing all of these errors but we don't implement this one here so we need to catch it as well and this is going to be a not found so if the error people equals to error code then here we are going to draw a not found all right but here on the send welcome email currently if we go inside the method we have all the codes to send it and it's going to work but we need to set up and create our environment variable and the template on the send grid so now that we're here on the dynamic templates just like we already did let's create a dynamic template it's going to be the welcome email let's hit create go to the welcome email and add a version can either use a design or you can just create our own let's add some text here i'm gonna write welcome to the newsletter hope you enjoy the newsletters to come the letters to come all right just some simple text you can give some more love to this email but i'll leave it like this save Let's go back and grab the ID. So click here and we can get it from here. Now let's go back to the environment variables and paste it here. I'm gonna delete the commas in case it conflicts, but it should be fine. Then we I think we're ready to start testing. What's what's right? So I'm going to restart the server because we changed the environment variables and also start the Servio port. Now, on our application, let's go ahead and type our email, sign up. We can see that the confirmation has been sent, and we see that the Google already hit the send confirm email, so we should have our email on our provider. Let's go and check it. I have mine here. I'm going to confirm it. We are redirected to our new page, as you guys can see and Google sent our send welcome email. Now, and click awesome, nothing happens. Let's go back to the email provider and check if we received our last email. And there we go. Here we have our welcome to the newsletter and hope you enjoy it. So we completed the whole flow of the email subscription. So we sent the last email, we sent the, the welcome email, which is the last one, and we did all of this now. As you can see that we moved very fast on this last chapter all of this because we set the whole infrastructure in the beginning and it's a very easy to work project that you can extend it and get a huge development experience from it but one thing that we want to check is the database what's happening in there so for that let's go to the server package json and create this command here the prisma ui you can either type this or you create the command. I like to create the command so I can remember it in the future. So let's go back to the server and do npm run Prisma UI. And this is the UI that comes with Prisma. Let me increase the font for you guys. And here we have our models. We have two entries, our first email, and then we have another email. This first one is the one that we tested. The token is deleted, he's confirmed. And then the second one, we still did not confirm it, and the token is still uh, to be deleted. So this guy probably has an email on his um, inbox to confirm it. But as you guys can see, these are the 
both main states on the database that there can happen. And with this, the project has been finally completed. And I'm really am proud of you if you managed to watch this far. And if you feel that all of this information is still not in yet, don't worry, because it just means that you need to practice more now. So go ahead and use the chapters on the course below to rewatch any parts where you struggle the most. Or if there's anything I can help you with, write in the comments and I'll give you my answer below. But finally, there is still one more thing that we need to do because the project works and it's beautiful, but it's just for us to, to show, right? Now, if you want to go ahead and push the project to the next level, let's go ahead and implement a complete CI CD and the deployment pipeline. So for that, this is the flow that we are envisioning. This load balancer here is completely optional, but the idea is that we can deploy our application to the cloud and let the outside world consume it instead of just us having our application on our machines. So we, the users, are going to request the API from the web app. So this is going to be your mobile phone or computer. But at the end of the day, this is the browser with different ends. Then different ends come communicate to the API where it's going to hit a multiple instance server. Now, this can be anything on the Google Cloud, could, could be a compute engine, a virtual machine from it, or a cloud run instance. That's what we're going to go with. It's very simple and scalable. Then the database is already deployed. And then the PubSub and the ML services are already deployed and are not on our care, right? All right, guys. So finally, we are at the deployment stage where we can finally have our application ready for our users, right? So the plan is to deploy the server to the Google Cloud Run. What's going to happen is that we're going to create a Docker image and deploy that Docker image automatically whenever you do any changes to our repo. Now, for the front ends, we're going to deploy everything to Vercel. The reason that we're going to go for Vercel and not Google Cloud, it's because it's free. Vercel is very easy to use. We just drop the project and it does everything for us and we don't have to pay anything. Unlike the server that we might have to pay some cents, although I've never paid it because it's very cheap and the runtime that we're going to use is very low. So, and another reason is that the backend scales way more than the frontend for our project, so it makes sense to scale the backend instead. Although Vercel does scale it on its own, so that's good. But at least you don't have to care about creating a load balancer, dropping files in the bucket, and having all of that fun stuff for the frontend. So without further ado, first we need to do some changes, because the project, although it's working locally, on production there are things that we need to change before it works. And the first mistake that I did was that I installed by mistake um, this package on the root of the project and it doesn't make sense to have the pub sub here. Instead, I just deleted it and I added on the server the package here. Another thing I did is I removed all of these carrots because what this means is that it's going to install patches and because we want to create a CI CD that is reproducible every time, I don't want to have patches installed from one version to another because it might include breaking changes, although it's unlikely. But still, I like to keep it safe. So let's start with the front end, which is going to be very easy. And the first thing we need to do is go here and let's create a vercel.json file. So what's going to happen is that vercel. Um, needs this file so we can tell it that the root of our project is an index.html because if you see here it's an index and what's going to happen is that we have multiple routes on it right we have these routes and the index is going to work for this but when we hit this route on the browser it's going to throw 404 Vercel doesn't know that this route exists because this is javascript route it's not an html route now the way i'm going to go for this to solve is creating this file which is going to have a rewrite our uh, index.html. And so I'm going to just drop this code here, rewrites from the source, everything to the destination, destination which, which is the index.html, this guy here. And if this doesn't make sense, 
it's fine and the idea is really what i just said it just rewrites any routes that for instance this, this route it goes to this one and it's going to work because the routing is in javascript it's on the react router side then another change we need to do is this proxy that we're using unfortunately it doesn't work for production at the time of recording i thought it would and it would be awesome because react scripts actually works this router this proxy it works but for re, uh, for Vite it doesn't i don't know why i tried to fix it and i couldn't so the only way i found it was to actually make a request to the backend itself without the proxy and that's a bit of a bummer for me but it's fine so what i did here is that i'm importing from the um environment variable instead you should already have created this environment variable so it's the same one so that's fine it's going to work just like the same so now that the front end is fixed let's just make sure that we commit those changes so just do git commit and then push those changes to your repository and make sure that it's done before following this step so after that's done let's click on start deploying what's going to happen is that we're going to be asked to create an account if we don't have one create one if you can make one with github so just a connection and then click on the deployments and here you are greeted with the projects that you have on your account i'm going to choose mine which is the newsletter project and let's click on import and then here you choose a project name so i'm going to have project uh, newsletter course which is going to be first i'm going to choose the base of our project because we have the server and the web Vercel already knows that this is a Vercel project, so we can already hit web. And it knows that this is a Vite project, not a Vercel. Sorry. Now, I think this everything is good. Let's just go to environment variables and let's create our environment variable. On the application, let's go and grab the Vite API URL. And let's drop. So for now, this is going to be the, the host. We're going to go back here and change because of course, we're not going to connect to localhost. It doesn't make sense. But for now, it's added. Just don't forget. And hit deploy. So it's done deploying on my side. Just some finishing touches now. And we have the application. We got this confetti. Awesome. Let's click on our application. And that is it, guys. It just deployed the front-end application to Vercel. Awesome. This is it. Now, this is not going to work because the API is localhost, and of course, we cannot connect localhost from the web. So let's just make sure that we go to the dashboard, and there we go. In the future, we're going to change the environment variables here. So let's just keep this page open. Now let's go for the backend and deploy the, the backend to the Google Cloud Run. So on the backend, just like the front end, we need to do some changes. The first one is here on the script. Basically, I need to add this changes so i did this change on the start where i do a prisma init and this is the comment that i added which does a prisma generate and a prisma db push if you see on the documentation of prisma they tell you to do these two commands before starting the server which means that we generate the schema every time and we do um, we push it to the source so to, to mongodb in this case just with this done we can save this and now, the first thing we need to do is we go here to Google Cloud and let's go to the Cloud Run. Let's click here on Create Service. Then let's start creating. So the first thing that we are asked is container image. So we need a container image to run, so it, which is a Docker image. There is a very simple way we can do this, which is continuous deploy from source. So we can do what we did on Vercel, which is just point our GitHub repo to the to the project and it's going to do automatically. But I like to do this manually from a Docker image to avoid unexpected issues. And we can also make it more uh, robust, which is going to what what we're going to do. So let's create a Docker file on the server and let's write one. So the first thing we're going to do is create from Node have a base. So this is a multi-stage deployment already. We set the work there, we copy the package JSON, so the, the lock and the JSON. We do an npm CI with all of these parameters, so we have a clean output. Then we have a builder stage where we install it 
and copy everything and do the builds. So it's just the builds. And then the final builds, the final stage, which is the runner we get from the builder, we just do npm start. So this is a very well built Docker image. You can use this on your projects as well. And with this, let's try and run this Docker image. So the first thing we're going to do is do a Docker build. Slash E. So this is going to be the name. I'm going to call this newsletter project course. Okay. And then if now let's add the dot. So it, this is going to build your image right now. And there's a caveat for me, which is I'm running this computer. So this computer is a M1 chip from Mac. If you have an M1 or an ARM architecture, you need to add one last parameter here, which is platform Linux AMD64. Now, if you add this argument and you don't have an M1 or an ARM architecture CPU, it's going to fail. So we know that it should not add. But if you have one, please add this because otherwise you're going to have an, an error when pushing this to the Google Cloud registry. So it's okay. And while that is building, it's still building on my machine, it takes a while. One thing we can do is create, start creating the continuous automation. So we're going to create a file called cloudbuilds.yaml. So this is what Google is going to look for to start automatically deployment. So whenever we do a commit to our um, repo, GitHub, um, Google is going to pick up that commit and do an automatic deployment. That's what we want. And so let's do that. So the first thing we define is our steps. So these are uh, sequential steps. The first one, we get the Docker image from Google and we do a build with a T. And here we're going to send this to my region. So this is a region I'm using. If you're on America or something like that, you can use this image, uh, this region. It's fine. But if you know a region, get the region here. Then we have the project ID and the service name, which are going to change here. Let's call this actually project course. So we are consistent. And then the path is going to be substitution variable that we're going to define a bit. The next step is the push. So we're going to push with this tag. Then we do a run. So this is the deployment. We're deploying what we built to the region and we are specifying some parameters here like the allow or not dedicated. Then finally, all we need is the substitutions, which are substituting these values here. And then last but not least, the image name that we also need to define here. Now the last step for the cloud build to be finished is we have to go to the root of the project. Let's create a new cloud build file. And the idea behind this cloud build is that we can basically, basically call the server cloud build and run it because we are on a mono repo setup so we cannot directly call this and in the future if we wanted to have a cloud build for the web we could also call it from here so this is a file it's pretty simple it just calls the server that's what i called it and it goes for the server and calls this so these are the changes we have cloud builds we have the docker file and then we have these package changes. Let's do a commit on this. Just so we have this on the GitHub whenever we do the, um, the setup on the Google Cloud. All right, so with the CI CD hopefully built, let's go ahead and do our first and hopefully last deployment to see if it works. So this is the image and we left it to build and it's built so we have a, a, a healthy image. I'm going to assume it works, so no need for doing a Docker run, but you can go ahead and do it. Um, but first, what I'm going to do is this is the step that we did. It's working. Now we need to push this image to the region which is on the GCP, so the, the registry. But first, I'm going to do is I'm going to tag this image, so the Docker, the news better project course, and I'm going to tag it with the same name here but with the substitutions already in place and let's go ahead and hit enter now we need to do a push so let's do this actual step here so docker push and the again the name of the uh, the tag you can remove this and just push the tag 
Now, this is going to fail because this repository does not exist on my Google Cloud. So let's go ahead and build it first. So here on the Google Cloud, let's go to Artifacts Registry. Let's go ahead and create it. Where is the button? It's here. And let's call it. I'm going to get the, the name correctly. Is it? And it's going to be format Docker. The region is going to be the region that you choose. For me, it's going to be Belgium. And that's done. It creates. And let's view it. All right, so let's try again to run the command and see if it works. There we go. So it's already uploading. And after this is done, I'll catch you guys. Oh, it's finished in uploading. Let's check out on the Google Cloud. I'm going to hit refresh. And there we go. Here we have our image that was just updated now. So with that done, we have a Docker image. All we need to do is actually create the run, the cloud run. Great service. And here, let's go ahead and select our newsletter project course, newsletter course, and the latest image. Here, this is the name of the, the, the run. And I'm going to call this on the Belgium. Here, I'm going to say that uh, just three. A cool thing about Cloud Run is that it reduces its number of instances to zero, so it auto scales back to zero. So if no one is using our application, you are not paying for it. This is very nice if you have a small project. If you want to make sure that your project is always running, because there is a cold start to it, you can have it one or two or three or whatever. I'm going to leave it zero. And then allow unauthenticated invocations. And let's create. All right, so it's doing our first deployment with that image that we just created. And the future deployments are going to be done with the cloud build um, file. So this is going to be done automatically, hopefully. We're going to see that in action in the bits where we're going to do some fixes in the code. And then we have all the deployment automatically. But first, let's see if this works. All right, so it is green. Let's check out the logs. We already have a URL for our API, so we can already copy this. And here we go. Our API is working and running on this image. So if we go here on a new page, let's hit it. It takes a while on the first time. And there we go. Not found, which of course it doesn't exist. But if we do slash v1 slash health, we have ourselves an OK API running on the cloud. So that is already done, guys. So the deployment on the API is done. But we still need to see if the automatic build and deployment is working. So for that, let's actually go to the the front end here and now we have our environment variable right let's go to edit i'm gonna actually just change this here and i'm gonna add slash v1 and save all right now let's go to deployments and let's do a redeploy on the last the latest builds so with the deployment done here, let's hit on the image or visits and let's see if this works. I just inspect it. I'm going to put my email and this is hopefully going to work and fail at the same time. I'm going to show you why. So the request has been done, but it's on the loop. So it's basically on the API probably crashed, but this worked. It didn't throw 404. That's nice. That's what we wanted. Now let's go back to the Google Cloud here and What's going to happen here on the logs if we check is that we are going to have an unauthenticated error here. And the reason for this is that we did not set up any environment variables. And that is very important to set up. So let's set up our all of them here. Now, a better way to do this would be to use the secrets. But because this is a project and I want to move fast, I'm going to use these environs here. But if you're going for production, use the secrets which are more scalable and you can have versions on them. 
So let's go ahead and copy all of these environment variables here. So I'm going to paste them on my side. You can just paste them on your side and then that is done. So one thing that you need to pay attention is here the app URL. Let's already grab them from here. You can use this one. Let's open the application. There we go. You got the app URL here. Not going to be localhost. And then the rest. Just make sure that everything is correctly placed. So like this. And that's it. Let's then put the values. So I just filled all of my environment variables and one last thing is a node env and set it to production. So this is a good practice to have. And then hit deploy. So mine is just deployed. Let's check the logs and here we go. We have the API running. Then let's go back to the application and try to hit the endpoints. There we go. The request failed, but at least we got the response. And now this is a new problem. This is the course error. Basically, we need to tell the server to allow this domain to be um, filtered. So to do that, let's go back to the codes and to the console. And then let's install a package called course. Course, just like this. And let's go to the API here on the server file. Let's use server.use course. Now let's import course up here like this and now what he's telling us is to install the types so you can go ahead and copy what they say here or apply the suggestion and we have the types for the TypeScript awesome so we can set up even further here so we can specify that we want just that domain like you can see the origin to be that domain but what I'm going to do is it's just going to allow everyone to access it, which is fine for now. And for this, pro this, for this project is fine. And I think that is all. Let's then commit. Actually, I'm going to use the GitHub, the VS Code's UI. I think it's friendlier. And let's do a fix course issue. Commit and push. Now let's go back to the Google and let's check if our cloud build is working. So let's go to the builds. And we should have an entry here. So there we go. It just went for the project on the GitHub and it's creating a new build. If you go inside it, we can see that it's calling the call server. And the call server is going to spawn an instance here. So there in a bit it's going to happen here a new build. And that is going to be the server building. For now, it's just getting the Google Cloud Docker images, and then it's going to start building the image. So there we go. So we have here a Google Cloud storage. Let's sit on this one. And this is are the steps that we created. So the first is the Docker build. Then we have the push, and then we have the actual deployment. So let's just wait two minutes and see if this is successful. So my build has just finished and it worked. Let's actually see if it deployed on the run. I'll just believe it until I see it. On the revisions, we have deployed one minute ago. So it's that, it's that one. And if we go to the logs, we have to have a fresh instance. So there we go. It's running and deployed. Now let's actually check if the course issue still persists. Let's hit this endpoint and let's hit sign up now. Now it's still loading, but we did not have the course. Let's check out what's the issue. So actually everything is running accordingly. And it was just taking a while. So you see that the email was sent. What happened was that because of the cloud run instance was cold started. So we had the cold start. The instance had to scale up and start up the server. So the first request takes a bit of time, but that's just the first one. So let's actually go to the email. And there we go. I got just an email. I hit confirm. I have the sign up so it's awesome it's working guys so you just have the tools to create our own your own ci cd and application from scratch so i think that is very awesome but there is just one thing that you need to do that i did behind the scenes already which is go to the pub sub and set up the con the subscription for production for the the sign up and then the welcome 
and the topics if you already have already done on your sites. So I already did this when I set up the development one and the subscription. What we need to do is go here if you already done it, if not create one. And the only difference is that the URL is going to be the endpoints of the cloud run. So this is that link that we copied from there and just replace it. Everything is the same. And with that done, you should have your application running and receiving emails. So guys, that, that is it. It's not that hard now that you've done it. And I truly hope that you enjoyed and learned something that you can use on your own projects and in production. This is a very fun project to have as on your portfolio, for example. So I hope you enjoyed.